they use the principles of leadership, they can be good leaders, in spite of the fact that they believe things that it's different from us. So be careful about the, uh, defining the leadership too narrowly because then you end up with a black and white world where only we are the ones that are led by God and our leaders are the good ones. And uh, if you have been around for more than two weeks in Adventism, you can quote some examples of decisions that we made as a church which were not the best decisions. So obviously in spite of the fact that we prayed and believed in God and believed rightly, we still did not <laughs> make the good decisions. Yes? It's true that we don't have a new holy over the Holy Spirit. Because this world is God's world. Yes. And God can move in this world. And I sometimes find it sad that we have had that this way. We have a new holy over God. Yeah, we don't. We know God very little. Yeah. We know as much as God reveals to us. But the scope and the extent of God we do not know. So the Holy Spirit, God who created this world, who work in this world anyway, he feels like. Mm -hmm. But what concerns me most is when we claim to know God. Yes. As soon as we claim to have that personal relationship with God, we expect something else from us. Mm -hmm. The working of the Holy Spirit is God forever. Yes. We cannot influence that. We cannot influence it. God will do whatever God wants to do. As Jesus said, the wind blows where he wants. You cannot influence them. However, when it comes to leadership, mm -hmm. in terms of God's people, when we have claimed that we have a personal relationship with God, we have actually declared to the world that we are unique, we are peculiar people. When we know all this, what God has revealed in an intimate, in a personal level, when my husband and I were looking through the study, we said, we know all this. We have talked about all this. We can go through the study in detail. Why are we failing when we become leaders? Mm. What Good make question. us not do what God has asked us to do? So it's not about who is a good leader. We can go through it in history, but the question is, what I know about what God expects of me, what type of leader or what type of influence I am here. Yes. Yes. And that's caused the question. Very good. Thank you, Emily. So I made the initial comments. Uh, I was thinking about the, 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 the argument between Elijah and Ahab. Yeah? Um, Ahab says you are the trouble of Israel, mm -hmm. and Elijah says you are the trouble of Israel. No, it's you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, who is the leader? Who, 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 who is who? You know, who is the one who is led by the Holy Spirit? And actually, you, you, you experience that in our church today, you see that problem in our church today. Okay, so who is the leader? Can you answer that from the lesson on Sunday? And uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, the so who is the leader? Back to the original question. All right, before we go there, did you deal with the memory text? Uh, yeah. No, I, it was no. I just used it as a point of departure. Okay, I didn't deal with it uh, in depth. Have, have you noticed? And all the people went their way to eat and drink, and to send the portions to others, and rejoiced greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. But why is this chosen as a memory text? Because they understood what was said, declared to them. So this brings us to the question: Who is the leader? Have you seen on a car a speaker? Don't follow me. <laughs> I am lost too. <laughs> so who is the leader? I know who is the leader. Pardon me? I know who is the leader. You know who is the leader? Yeah. Who? He might not be sure I'm the leader. 
would be my book and my mind. God is our leader. Sure, yeah. sure. And he's the leader all the time and every day. Okay. But sometimes yes. you recognize it. So you are a leader if you have those who follow you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so why is the text chosen as a memory text? That's why the text yeah, is there, the text, because, because that's a sign of the leader. That's a sign of the leader that people got the message mm -hmm. that they were supposed to do, that Ezra and Nehemiah wanted them to get. Mm -hmm. By the way, because we had Christmas season, did you notice uh, how they celebrated? Mm -hmm. Okay, in, in verse 10. In verse 10, do you have verse 10 in your Bibles? Can somebody read? Yes, yes, this is verse 12. So here it just says, and the people went their way to eat, eat what? And drink. Drink what? You have to go back to verse 10. So read verse 10. And Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. Yeah, that's a good translation. His holy to our Lord, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's a good translation because if you have King James Version, mm -hmm. it says, Go and eat the fat <laughs> and drink the sweets. Okay? So this is not a dietology recipe for you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Eugene Peterson in the Message Bible, he translates, Eat the holiday food and drink the holiday drink. Now here's the message. There is an ordinary food and there is a holiday food. Okay? Anybody here was eating this week the way you eat in July? No. <laughs> Anybody ate better this week than in July? Now remember, the Bible says it's important. If you don't have holiday food, if you don't have a holiday drink, life and world is going to become attractive to you. Because if everything is just the same all the time, mm -hmm. evil is going to look attractive. Mm -hmm. You need to have holiday food, holiday clothes, holiday places. Mm -hmm. You don't have a lot of time to go. Then the Bible says that you are supposed to take that second tithe and spend it on rejoicing. Because if you don't, The world is going to look attractive to you, and you end up in bad things. So Nehemiah, as a good leader, knows there is time to eat, there is time to fast, and there is time to eat holiday food. Okay, but let's go back to that. So this is very important, and remember January is coming, and all the health clubs will be oversubscribed. People will pay their dues for the whole year because they were eating holiday food and now they make the New Year resolutions and then by the beginning of February that will be forgotten and they will rejoice that they got the whole year of peace, you know. Okay, who are the leaders? Sunday. What's the most important thing about leadership? Influence. influence. Leaders are those who have influence. So, let me say this, this is very important. The difference between a spiritual gift and spiritual life. So there is such thing as a prayer. What is prayer? Talking to God. 
talking to God as a friend. So if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, somehow, somewhere in your life, there needs to be a time when you talk to God. I travel about 120, about 120 days a year. It used to be more, but now it's, 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 it's less. We don't have Pakistan, we don't have Sudan, etc. in our division, so it's about 120 days. Now, if I don't talk to my wife, the relationship is not going to thrive. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, if I want to have a thriving relationship, <coughs> we need to talk. We don't need to talk all the time, but if we never talk, you can be sure that the relationship is going to go south, as they say in America. <laughs> it's going to go down. If you never talk to God, you can be sure the relationship is not going to thrive. So every believer needs to talk to God sometimes. Now, if you are a morning person, probably you would prefer morning time. If you are an evening, if you are an owl, you will probably prefer different things because I once met a Baptist preacher and he said, before 12 o'clock, I am not even a Christian. He was obviously an evening person. So, if you, somebody tells you you need to get up at 6 and talk to God, it doesn't work for you if you are an evening person, but somehow, somehow you need to talk to God, okay? So that's spiritual life. Now then there is a spiritual gift. Have you heard about the gift of prayer? Have you been ever to an area day of fellowship? And somebody comes to a microphone and they say a prayer and you say, wow. Yeah. That spoke from my heart. I could say amen to that. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, when a prayer is offered, somebody says, Oh, sister, could you come and pray? And so, well, it's not polite to say, Ah, I don't want to pray. <laughs> they think, What kind of Christian are you? You don't want to pray. And so they come and they say something. But if the person who is praying, and you know how we say, Close your eyes and. Uh, Bow your mind, you know. Probably should say, close your mind. <laughs> and bow your if the person who is saying the prayer has fainted or just became unconscious, and the person there who was watching what's going on jumped in and finished the prayer, most people whose heads are bowed and eyes are closed would not even notice that a different person finished the prayer because it's always the same. It's always the same. And for most prayers, you are not inspired, you are unwed, because you have heard it all before. But sometimes, somebody with the gift of prayer comes to the microphone and they say a prayer, they say, wow, that touched my... I was really blessed today by that prayer. Because it's, it expressed my feelings. It said things in a way that I could never verbalize. Why? Because it's a supernatural gift. It's a gift of the Spirit. And so some people have the gift of prayer. Now, everybody needs to pray, but some people have the gift of prayer. Are we clear on that one? Yes. Another example. Faith. Romans 12 says that God gave everyone a measure of faith. And a measure... Get it? <laughs> Okay. Do we have five minutes? Uh, yeah, do ten minutes. Okay. okay. Faith. Everybody needs to have, has a measure of faith. By the way, metron in Greek is a bucket which is 36 liters. So everybody has enough faith to take them to the New Jerusalem. But then there is a gift of faith. I was a student at New Gold College in 1981. And Michael Kulakov from Russia, from the Soviet Union, was there. And he said to me, Daniel, one day you will come and teach in our seminary in Russia. Do you realize, 1981, that was still in Brezhnev's era, no perestroika, no change, there was no way that you could foresee that one day the situation will change and you will have a school, a seminary, and that I will go and teach there. You know what happened in 1990? Uh, 1990, mm -hmm. eight years later, mm -hmm. 
we had a seminary for two years. And the G, they asked the GC, can you send us some teachers with theological degrees who can teach? In 1990, I went to Russia to teach. What's that? That's the gift of faith. That's a capacity to see what other people don't see. Now, there's a gift of teaching. You know what is the gift of teaching? It's a capacity to connect the dots. So that, remember in the children's Sabbath school, when they gave you a piece of paper and there were just dots and numbers on them, and the teacher said, connect one to two, three, and, and you did that suddenly, a duck appeared on that piece of paper. So, oh, I have no idea there's a duck there. Teachers have a supernatural capacity to connect the dots so that you see things you did not see before. Now, here's the thing. Leaders have a supernatural capacity to to influence people, to have a vision, to say, guys, we need to go to that mountain, and I will take you there. I will show you how to get there. Evangelists have a supernatural capacity to put the finger on the pulse and say, Madam, you have been coming to these meetings for three months. We have been studying the Bible together for six months. Don't you think it's the time to make the decision? You ask a teacher to do that, and they will blow it eight of ten times. They just don't have the gift. But the, team, the leaders have the gift of influencing people. Most people know what they should do. If you are a counselor, they will tell you, most people don't come to counselor because they are clueless. They already know what they should do. They just don't have the motivation to do it. And leaders have the capacity to influence people. Now, there are leaders who have the position and authority, and there are leaders who have the influence. Those who have the position and authority often don't have the gift of leadership because they use the authority and the position to make other people do what they want them to do. And of course, then they can uh, trample on people and use them for their selfish. But the first thing about leadership is influence. Now, you might not have a gift of leadership, but you still have an influence. And though it's the leaders in Israel, this lesson applies to you next week because you have some influence. Do you think that, uh, that uh, Do you think that Rosa Parks, when she refused to give up her seat on the bus, do you think that she saw herself as a leader? No. 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 She was just an ordinary lady. But she said, this is wrong. This is wrong. Things should not be like this. Let me do something about it. In your sphere of influence, not giving the bus on a seat. And my. What an impact on the world. Simon Sinek says, of those people who came to listen to Martin Luther King and his speech, I have a dream. How many of them showed up because of Martin Luther King? Very few. Very few. You would not travel in the whole Washington weather in August and stand there on the sun to listen to a man. But they were there because they knew something is wrong with America. Things are not supposed to be like this. We should do something to change it. So you have influence. Okay. Then there are good leaders and the bad leaders. It's about the capacity to formulate why. Most people know what to do, but the leader can tell you, and that's why we need to go for the mountain. So the leaders have not only the influence, but they have the capacity to formulate why in the world. While evil leaders are only concerned about their means. What is it in it for me? And then they use other people to achieve their goals. Okay. Uh, the, the courage and empowerment. Can you tell me how you 
next week that apply this. How would you show courage where you are next week? In Adventism, if you are a male and you want to serve the Lord, you either become a pastor or an elder. An elder. Or co porter. Okay. If you are female, you either become a nurse or a teacher. Don't take this everywhere. If you use your influence for something good. What about being an advocate for those who don't have a voice. To stand up for someone who can stand up for themselves. Or maybe to stand up for yourself. Mm -hmm. Maybe next week, someone who is steaming, rolls steaming over you, you can stand up and say, I'm not going to throw away this anymore. Mm -hmm. What about trying something new experience? Trying a new experience. Yes. The courage aspect, uh, for me, I think it's easy to stand up for yourself, usually. What is not so easy for us is to stand up for somebody else yes. who is being trodden on. That's right. And um, it takes courage. It, it takes courage. And that's where I think the courage for me would be exemplified. That if I see somebody uh, out in the street, that, you know, people are doing bad things, for me, I need to stand up. Yes. But uh, that would mean I'm putting myself in danger zone, but I need to have that courage. That's right. God will take care of the, the danger. I need to stand up. You may not do something great, but by having courage to stand up for someone, you help that person and you change the world for the better. Yeah. Yes? Being the first person. It's like when everyone else is just being quiet, I'm being the first person to say something. You will almost be the first person to say something. Okay, very good. You know, everyone else is talking, it's like, oh, that shouldn't happen. Everyone will agree that shouldn't happen. But in the moment, and we'll put a hand up and say, we should have done it. That's, this is what we should have done. Yeah. And this is important because whether you have the gift of leadership, you know, it's only about 4 to 6% of people who have the gift of leadership. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you still can next week have the courage and stand up for something important. Mm -hmm. Yes, Emily? I want to slightly look at it differently. I don't think it's about a person or people. I think it's about principles. Of course. Because of, which is of, the principle is based on the cause. It depends on who calls we have agenda we have to look at. Whether it's God's agenda and his cause, whether it's ourselves, whether it's people, whether it's last, whether it's first, we God want people who will stand for principles okay. for his principles. Irrespective of the sending, irrespective of the grouping, irrespective if it's related to yourself or not yourself. Mm -hmm. But it's sometimes very difficult for people to stand up for principles. Sure. Because if you stand up for principles, it does not matter who is being affected. Yes. Because the principle will cover all. And we have the example in the lesson of Caiaphas who says, we need to do what is expedient for the nation. And it's around with the bad leadership. If you do what is expedient, you will not stand up for it. For example, we have no When they were formulating that uh, policy, that's in the business that would be policy. Sure. Okay. When they were formulating the policy on how to use their oil, it was not about the next generation or individual. It was about a cause. Where do we want our country to become or to reach? And they realized in order for the country to go forward, the generations after them have to have something to work with. Otherwise, the politicians will use all their money and give people goodies so that they vote for them in the next election and then it's gone. By the force, they are not in this alone. Yeah. Automatically, it's implemented from generation to generation. So it is a cause, it's a principle to stand for. And okay. Yes. Okay. Let, let me finish. Have you seen how the book of Nehemiah ends? He, he goes away, we talk about the, the marriages and the decisions last week. Then he goes away and then he comes back and he realizes, uh-oh, you still have a problem. Things once again got went south, you know. And suddenly the guy realizes, okay, my influence is limited. What happens when I'm not around? And so he verbalizes this fear that, okay, I did what I was able to do in my time, 
He verbalizes his fear. I don't know what will happen afterwards, but I leave it in your hands, God. So the book ends this way. Remember them, O oh my God, because they defile. Okay. Verse 22, if you are on the last page, chapter 13. Remember me for this also, and show me mercy according to your great love, because I did this Sabbath, I enforced this Sabbath keeping. And also, in verses 23 to 28, he did this reorganization of priestly work, but some people were, the Sambalat, the Horonite, in verse 28, was opposing him. So he says in verse 29, and remember them, O oh my God, because they defile the priestly office and they covenant as the priesthood and the Levites. So remember the good things which I did and remember the bad things which they did. Mm -hmm. And then, so I purified the priest and the Levites and everything for it and assigned them duties, each to his own task. I also made a provision for contribution of wood at designated times. Remember, it's a desolated city, so for the sacrifices they need wood. So, as a good administrator, he can even think of his detail that they will need wood for the, wood for the uh, sacrifices. And then the book ends, and remember me with favor, oh my God. Full stop. Why is that? And now I leave it in your hands. And you want to know so what happened? Where did he go? What happened to him? These are the questions I have. When he came back, was Artaxerxes impressed with what he did? Was he glad he let him go? Was the nation better off? And by the way, somebody succeeded 400 years later. Because Israelites would not even look at a foreign woman, women, when Jesus came. They would have nothing to do with the, the Gentiles. And if they had to buy the vegetables from them, when they came back from the market, they did ceremonial cleansing. You know, they put water that goes into half of the eggshell and they cleanse their hands because I had nothing to do. We had to buy the vegetables from you, but we are not like you guys. And everything that is where they might try to accomplish. They manage by the time Jesus comes. And he says, there is no life in this spirituality. Let me show you a better way. Now remember how he treated Samaritan woman? Did he send her away to her first husband? He showed her you Why is that happening? Because the book is ultimately not about the Remember Luke 15? But the older brother said, 